Well, welcome back, uh, folks. We're starting a whole new adventure today. Uh, first of all, if you're tuning in today, expecting to hear the final presentation about ancient history in the Bible, you're going to have to wait till tomorrow because my senior moment, I double booked myself and uh, didn't realize that I was scheduled to start Ozark's history today. So I'm going to do that tomorrow at the township here. And uh, you can either watch it live at two o'clock tomorrow, Central Standard Time, or you can catch it on video. But today we're going to start talking about something that I absolutely love. And that's Ozark's history. Um, here we are. Where am I here now? Okay. I don't know what I've done here. I don't, I've lost myself. Hang on here. Uh, am I still hooked up? Yeah, Tony, we can see you. Okay, I don't know what happened. Uh, so you wanna do a share screen? I don't know what happened there. I maybe got ahead of myself. There I am. There we go. <laughs> I'm so excited. I just messed up technologically, too. Oh, boy. There we go. Okay. So this is a subject that I just absolutely dearly love. And I guess that's because I'm a native-born resident of the Ozarks my whole life. Now, I know some of you back in Kentucky and Ohio may say, well, what's that got to do with me? You got to remember, the Ozarks tradition the Ozarks culture is the direct descendant of the Appalachian Mountains. And I suspect that many of you, particularly back in the southeastern part of Ohio, uh, Kentucky, probably have uh, some ideas about what I'm talking about, maybe some, some you know, connection with that area. So let's start talking about Ozarks history. By the way, uh, Rachel asked me what my background was. That is the old Hopkins Mill in uh, Douglas County. We have a tremendous amount of old restored water mills in the Ozarks. And we'll be talking about those next week. We'll see some of these. So why am I able to even talk about the Ozarks? Uh, my bona fides. You know, when somebody new came to town, a hundred years ago, they expected them to prove to people exactly how they were authentic, how they were genuine. So what is it that makes me able to talk about the Ozarks? Now, I'm a history teacher and I've got three college degrees, but I'll have to tell you, I never took one course in Ozarks history. I, I'm not for sure I ever had the Ozarks even talked about in any of my classes. Uh, and while it's true, I've read hundreds, maybe thousands of books and articles about the Ozarks. That's not what makes me, if I could label myself an expert about the Ozarks, it's my background. You see that man sitting there? That's my grandpa, Joe. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I sat at his feet, listening to the stories he told. Uh, telling me about the Ozarks, and uh, I just absolutely love that man. In fact, one of my prized possessions, you can't see it, but right on the other side of that chair was his little smoking cabinet, and I've still got that, even though I had to give up most of our antiques and things. When we moved to independent living, I kept that because it just reminds me of the stories that he told me so much. Uh, I just, I learned so much about the Ozarks from listening up from oral tradition, from him, my mom and dad, my aunts and uncles, and they gave me an outlook upon what it means to be an Ozarker. And, and their stories always kind of prompted me to try to learn more about the Ozarks. So what did I learn? Well, first of all, I learned that my family roots are really deep seated in the Ozarks. I am a sixth generation Ozarker. Uh, I've been here, my family's been here since almost 
from the time that uh, Missouri was explored and discovered by the Americans. Uh, most of my ancestors hailed from the upland south of the Carolinas, Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, the Appalachian area. Uh, they were almost all Scots-Irish, but I've got some Native American, some German, some English blood in me. Uh, absolutely nobody in my family were famous. I can guarantee you there's not one famous person in my family. Uh, we have a few infamous people in my family, and uh, I'll even tell you about some of those as we get into the course. Most were materially poor, but they were rich in spirit and courage and patriotism. And most of them absolutely lacked any kind of formal education. Uh, I am the first Stevenson to ever go to college. Uh, in fact, I only had an aunt before me that went to high school. So my family uh, it did not come from a long line of, of people that were highly educated by any means at all. They were farmers, they were gristmill operators, they were tie hackers, they were lead miners, they were moonshiners. They were merchants. They just, they were hillbillies, folks. That's exactly what they were. Now, does that make me an expert on hillbilly uh, Ozark history? No, not necessarily. But it gives me an interest that I really want to try to help people understand exactly what this region is all about. Kind of go into it. And again, this isn't about my family. I can guarantee you this is all I'm going to talk about when it comes to my family today, but I'm, I'm trying to let you know how important it is that, that you understand my interest and uh, my knowledge about the Ozarks. This is my great-great-grandfather, Matthew. He was the first one that came to the Ozarks. He came here in 1843 on a wagon train from Roan County, Tennessee, south of, uh, you know, uh, chatted, uh, pardon me, uh, uh, around Kingston, uh, right on the, uh, the river there. Uh, he was accompanied by his wife, his children, several brothers, as well as his father, John, who had originally come from Ireland in 1791. He was the first Stevenson. Uh, three of his sons served in the Civil War. And this is my great grandfather, Jacob, here. He was severely wounded in the Civil War. That was his brother, John, who was killed in the Civil War. That was his brother, uh, Daniel, who would now have suffered what we know now as PTSD and eventually was murdered after the Civil War in a, in a situation. Um, they were related to several of the old families here in the Ozarks, the Keltners, the Hicks, the Crabtrees, the Bolins, the Slays. Used to be a family a saying about the slaves. It said when the slaves came to town, everybody else went home. That kind of gives you an idea. Uh, this is another example of one of my ancestors, my maternal great great grandfather. Her name was Jesse Ballard James. Now, my mom always told me she was related to Jesse James. And I said, Mom, everybody in the Ozarks claims to be related to Jesse James. And she said, no, I'm telling you, I was, I was related to Jesse James. Well, after she passed, uh, I got into genealogy. And lo and behold, I found that that she was, her great-grandfather was Jess, Jesse Ballard James. That is not the outlaw Jesse Ballard James. It's a different Jesse James. But she knew what she was talking about. It's just that she got it messed up and she thought that our re our relative was the outlaw Jesse James. Uh, he was a grist mill operator, the old dot mill. If you're familiar with the dark, let me know where it's at. Uh, he was hung by Confederate bushwhackers, by the way, in 1861 because he uh, wanted to mill corn uh, for the Union side, and he was related to the Freedmen, the Pierce, the Hogs. This is my great great grandmother Sarah Jane Edgar. You look at her, and I bet you immediately recognize she's a full-blooded Cherokee Indian. She was born near Mammoth Cave, Kentucky in 1831. She came to Christian County as a young girl on the Trail of Tears and dropped off and married a man at the age of about 14. And uh, later on, he was killed, and she married this man, who was my great-great-grandfather. 
they're buried at Wilson's Creek National Cemetery, which is about two miles from here. And uh, it's, uh, you know, related to several different families. And then here is my maternal great-grandfather, name's Bill Upshaw. And that is my grandmother, Maud, who I never knew any of these people. They were all, all died uh, early and young. But uh, he was one of the grandsons and one of the earliest pioneers of Douglas County. If you're from the Ozarks, you know that Douglas County is called Booger County and uh, came there from Buckingham County, Virginia, uh, settled around a little town called Dora, Missouri. So enough about my family. And again, this is in the, this is in the presentation on my family. I'm just trying to relate to you uh, where my interests come from and where some of my knowledge comes from. So if I was to ask you, if I was to go out anywhere and say, what's the first thing you think of when you think of the Ozarks? Most people outside of the Ozarks and a lot of people inside of the Ozarks would say the first thing they think of is a hillbilly. That's, that's what we're known for is the hillbilly culture. So we got some questions we need to answer today before we go on and start our study of the Ozarks in the next several weeks. What's the stereotypical image of the hillbilly? What's the origin of the term hillbilly? Where did that term even come from? Uh, how did the stereotype of the hillbilly get so ingrained in the public? Why do people, when they think of the Ozarks, what the, why do they immediately turn to the hillbilly? Uh, if indeed it is a stereotype, then what's the authentic traits of a hillbilly? And finally, did it even exist anymore? Are there, are, are there really anything like the old hillbilly still left or is it all a state of mind up here? So those are some questions we're gonna answer here real briefly. <clears throat> now we all know what a stereotype is. It's a widely held but fixed oversimplified image or an idea of a particular type of person. We, we all know what a stereotype is. I stereotype all the time, and I know I shouldn't, but I, you know, I tend to just clump all peoples together from a certain area or region. Um, New York City, everybody in New York City has to be rude and boisterous and loud. And I know that's not true, but in my mind, I can't help but think that's true. And uh, I know that there's not that, that's not true at all. So when you think of a stereotype of the Ozarks, this is what you think of, a hillbilly band. Um, if you don't know, this was one of the earliest uh, music acts that started off in Branson, Missouri, which lies about, oh, 40 miles south of here and is the live music capital, country music capital of the world. Nashville may be the country music capital, but Branson is the live country music capital. You can, it's just an absolute wonderful entertainment mecca. So if indeed that's a stereotype of the hillbilly, then what are the real, you know, what are the, what are these traits? What do we, what do we think of when we think of what a hillbilly is? Well, he's lazy. He's shiftless, right? He's barefoot. Didn't wear shoes. Always toting his rifle, usually smoking his corn cob pipe, drinking his moonshine. Always got a long beard, like a billy goat. Not very smart, and speaks with a real slow hillbilly accent. Right? That's what we think of when we think of what a hillbilly is. In other words, he's little Abner the greatest comic strip of all time. Little Abner was the best-selling comic strip in the history of comic strips. Or it was the Beverly Hillbillies. I mean, who hasn't watched the Beverly Hillbillies? In fact, case you can still watch them on TV. I watch them still yet today. I still laugh at them. I've watched them so many times, I know exactly what's going to happen. But I still laugh at the Beverly Hillbillies. So where'd the term come from? Where do we get the term hillbilly? Well, first of all, it comes from the origin of the Scotch-Irish traditions from Northern Ireland. Uh, there was a lot of Northern Irish people 
that became known as Scots-Irish that immigrated to the United States in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And they brought with them their culture, their musical culture, their language, their stories, their way of life. And those traditions settled in the area of we now know mainly as Appalachia and later on in the Ozarks. And there's, you know, there's a lot of Scots-Irish in those areas. Uh, one of the great folklorists, studiers of Ozarks folklore, a man by the name of Vance Randolph, you'll hear a little bit more about him, in the late 19th and early 20th century said he first heard the term hillbilly in 1915, but trust me, it had been around before that. Uh, the first recorded use of the term was in 1902 in a dictionary of the American English. But where did it come from? Well, here's where it came from, as far as anybody can tell. Probably originated with the Ulsterite, the Northern Irish Protestant followers of King William of Orange. King William uh, was involved in what's called the Glorious Revolution of England in 1688. And he came over from uh, what we now know as the Netherlands and disposed the Stuart dynasty, James II, threw him out of office and took over the kingship of England. His followers, and he had a lot of them, particularly in Northern Ireland, came to be known as Billy Boys uh, because of their, you know, were very, had a strong allegiance to him because he was a strong Presbyterian which is what they were. Well, later on, these Billy boys came to America. <clears throat> and as we know, a lot of them settled, the Scotch-Irish, in the early on in the Appalachian Mountains. And when the American Revolution broke out, they became very strong uh, proponents of the Patriot cause. They were very much... Uh, involved in the fighting of the American Revolution. In fact, I read books that say that probably anywhere from 50 to 60 percent of the soldiers in the American Revolution were Scots-Irish. As a result, the English began calling them hill billies. They were billy boys from the hills, so they became known as hillbillies. And of course, as they moved into Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas, Missouri, they brought with them their hillbilly culture. So that's how that came around. So how did the stereotype develop? How did we learn about the stereotype <clears throat> of the hillbillies? Well, to begin with, back in the 19th century, uh, the Courier Knives Company, if you, I'm sure some of you out there know about Courier Knives. They used to be one of the biggest lithographic companies in America in the 1800s. And they were very famous for, for making calendars particularly. And they would hire painters to travel all over America and paint famous scenes. And they would put them on their calendars and people would hang them in their cabins in their walls. Because remember, most people didn't have money for decorations. So a calendar was oftentimes the biggest decoration in their, in their cabin or their, or their house. Well, one of these painters was Edward Payson Washburn. And he traveled to Arkansas in the mid 1800s. And he painted a scene which he, and they, which he called the Arkansas Traveler. And this painting became one of the more famous paintings of the Courier Knives Company. And it absolutely set in, you know, where everyone could see it, what the stereotype of the Ozarker was. By the way, that original painting still hands, uh, stands, hangs in the Arkansas Historic Museum in Little Rock. And on top of that, we also got a fiddle song that was made up about the Ozark Traveler, which was a uh, composed by a man by the name of Sandy Faulkner, and he only added to the stereotype. This is the painting. Now, I want you to look at this painting real closely. Look here, you got the man on horseback. That would have been the Arkansas traveler. 
And he has come upon the scene here, a man in the log cabin. And look what he sees. He sees an old log cabin, which is pretty ramshackle. He's got the guy sitting out here playing his fiddle with his raccoon, his coonskins cap on. Uh, you've got children hanging around. Most of them called shirt tail children because they, you know, they don't have very many clothes on or pants. You got the woman sitting here. She's smoking a pipe, by the way. And you got the dog sitting here. He's got his rifle off to the side. And of course, in case you missed it, there's the sign whiskey up above the door. Well, that just set in stone for so many people what the people that lived in the Ozarks was like. And there was some truth to that. You know, let's not lie about it. Uh, you know, to some degree, the early on residents of the Ozarks probably looked and, and acted like that for the most part. By the way, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to try to play a video. And uh, I'm going to do this because if you're like me, you like music. And I'm going to play you or show you a video of a young girl down in Arkansas that's going to be playing the Ozark Traveler uh, fiddle song accompanied by a man on the banjo. And it's a, I mean, I can't see this enough. And I hope you enjoy it too. It lasts about three minutes, so just sit back and enjoy it. for watching this is my mentor mr jim wood here he taught me everything i know about how to play the fiddle he's uh playing the banjo but he uh knows how to play every instrument under the sun and he's produced my record and uh, he's producing my next record and he has a awesome studio out here in flat creek where we're filming this video and uh anyway okay i think you could if you listen to that and you saw it i think you could all see the influence of the scotch irish tradition there going on, the Irish jig, the, the, the clogging, uh, the Irish step dance, it's all there, plus the music. So the next big step in the development of the stereotype of the Ozarker 
was the writing of one of the most famous books in American publishing history, The Shepherd of the Hills, uh, written by a man by the name of Harold Bell Wright, and we'll hear more about him later on. Uh, he wrote a book in, that was first published in 1906, and I'll bet you some of you out there have read this book. I've read it. I've seen the, uh, the outdoor theater show at Branson. Uh, it, it's a very well-known book. Now, today, it's pretty dated, and it definitely uh, enhances the stereotypical image of the Ozarker. But folks, this book, most people don't realize how famous this book was. It was the first book to sell over a million copies, and he was the first novelist in American history to become a millionaire. Uh, there was over 40 million copies of this book published in the history of American novel. I mean, that is phenomenal. In fact, at one point in time, only the Bible had more copies published than did The Shepherd of the Hills. Now, of course, now, you know, there have been other books that have overtaken that record as far as The Shepherd of the Hills, but it still stands as one of the most widely published books in American history. It was that popular. Of course, it spawned a whole generation of movies. Um, there was a real famous one in the 1930s starring John Wayne. Uh, and most of the characters in this book were based on people that Harold Bell Wright encountered in Taney County down around Branson as he was recovering from some illness that he had. And again, we're going to talk more about this when we get into the tourist industry. And there's the book, The Shepherd's Hills. By the way, that's the first edition of The Shepherd's Hills, and I'm that's one of my prized possessions. I still have that book, uh, one of the first ones that was ever published. So if all that is stereotype, if that's just all stereotype about hillbillies, if, if they're really not Little Abner and the Beverly Hillbillies and the characters out of, uh, you know, the... Uh, Shepherd of the Hills book and, and what Edward Payson Washburn painted. What is a real hillbilly? What are the traits of the real hillbilly, the real Ozarker? Well, first of all, they're independent, very independent. They're honest. I mean, honest to a fault. Sometimes so honest that they uh, make people mad because of what they say. Uh, strong work ethic. Uh, very strong worth it work as self-reliant um if you were to find an old-time hillbilly place like i remember growing up as a kid they never threw anything away because they wanted to keep it because they depended upon themselves uh to make their life very clannish they tended to be very insular not necessarily introverted but they just you know they particularly had a small group of family and friends that they hung with and uh, didn't get out a lot other than that. That's because they were somewhat distrustful of authority. Uh, again, this is part of the Scots-Irish tradition. They just didn't really like people telling them what to do. Uh, their sense of humor. A lot of people don't think they have sense of humor. Actually, they have, they have a very droll sense of humor. It's a dry sense of humor. Uh, Sometimes it can be a little off color. Uh, my wife will tell you that sometimes that I tend to forget uh, my heritage and uh, start telling off color things. She has to remind me about that. And they're very patriotic. I mean, they are, I mean, they'll serve at the drop of a hat, particularly in the military. Uh, again, you go back and look at the history of the Scotch Irish in the military, and there have been whole books written about this. The fact that, uh, they were very strong uh, in service to the country, very patriotic. This is an example of a real Ozark family. This isn't a stereotype. This is an Ozark's family sitting here. Uh, you can look at the old cabin that's, that's falling down just about, sitting on the well, um, and you can tell these people are not wealthy at all. Just so happens, that is my great, great grandfather, Bill Upshaw, that I showed you a picture of earlier. That's his wife, Lily. And that's my mom. 
they helped raise her because her father abandoned her when she was a child and uh, the mother got really sick. And so they basically helped raise my mom. That's a typical Ozark hillbilly. I can guarantee you that man right there and that woman had all those traits that I'm talking about. I still have those traits. You know, I, you know, I still, you know, can identify with every one of those. So one last thing we need to talk about before we quit here is being a hillbilly. Is there really such a thing as being a hillbilly anymore? Is it a lifestyle or is it a mindset? Is it something that you just think of? Now, you know, to look at me and to listen to me, uh, I'm not a hillbilly, but I've still got that mindset to some degree. So uh, let me read you something. I, uh, again, I'm, I'm not talking so much about myself here, but I happen to write a book about the Ozarks. It was called The Ozarks of Personal History. And no, I'm not trying to sell copies of the books because there are no copies of the books left. I sold them all. I've got two copies for myself and that's it. But uh, I wrote about basically uh, what I'm gonna be talking about for the next several months here about the Ozarks. And in that I addressed this very question, is it a mindset? Or is it a lifestyle? And, you know, I think I, I put it pretty well here towards the end of the book. So I thought I'd read this for you. This is what I wrote. I was born in a time of transition in the Ozarks when the traditional lifestyle of the hillbilly was giving away to a more modern time. My mother and father were of a generation that could recall the first time they turned on an electric light or saw an automobile roll into town. They knew what it was like to run down a path to fetch water from the creek and to heat bath water on the wood stove. They could remember the first time they turned on a radio and heard crackly voices coming from an unseen faraway place. They were of a time when a trip to Springfield here in the Ozarks was a trip of the year, maybe a lifetime. But they were also of a time when a man's word was his bond and when you agreed to work, you worked until you could not physically stand up anymore. They welcomed strangers into their home to share with them the last bite of food and let them sleep on the back porch, unafraid of being robbed or harmed. They refused help from the government until they were either forced or unable to fend for themselves. They knew what it was like to walk down to the river and see a ribbon of clear blue water cutting through the land teeming with fish. They knew what it was like to spend an evening sitting on the front porch, looking up at the sky, lit by a million stars, while conversing with each other. And while it's true, if one looks hard enough, they can still find a lived-in cabin without electricity or running water, but it's difficult. Those crystal blue rivers and starry skies still exist if you can get enough far enough away from the neon lights of the towns and the cities. But for the most part, the Ozarks of my mother and father's time had disappeared. Where cornfields existed in my youth, subdivisions full of cookie cutter houses stretched for miles. We now live in a homogenized society where everyone talks the same, dresses the same, thinks in unison. And that's not all bad folks, because most of us wouldn't want to give up our air conditioning, our high definition TVs or our smartphones. Most of us don't want to live on a diet of ham and beans and fried potatoes. We, can, we have just about any food we want, from pizza to cashew chicken. By the way, I still love ham and beans and fried potatoes. How many of us really would want to go back and live the life of the traditional hill person? And yet, I can remember back at a time when I would climb into a canoe with a good friend of mine, begin to leisurely float down the unspoiled, pristine Jack's Fork River, listening to the symphony of nature created by the animals living on the riverbank and in the woods. And it somehow magically transported me back to a time when being a hillbilly was something more than being a state of mind. It was a life. I don't live that life anymore. Most people in the Ozarks don't live that life. 
but we can still have the mindset. Now, are there real hillbillies left? Yeah, there are. Um, if you're familiar with the Ozarks, without a doubt, one of the most famous musical groups to ever come out of the Ozarks in the 1970s was a group called the Ozark Mountain Daredevils. Uh, they were a folk rock group, uh, never became as famous as some of the other folk rock groups, but they were pretty famous. And uh, they put out an album called Men From Earth. And this was the cover of that album. And you'll notice a couple of boys, though. This is Roscoe and Clarence Jones. That's Roscoe on here, and that's Clarence's son. And uh, they lived in a little town <clears throat> of Boaz, Missouri. Boaz lies halfway between Nixon and Clever. If you don't know where that's at, just look it up on a map. Um, anyway, Clarence and Roscoe became acquainted with some of the Ozark Mountain Daredevils. And when they wrote their, they put out their album, they decided to put them on the cover. And these two became almost like celebrities. They were invited to parades. Uh, they were, they always traveled around in a wagon and horses. They never drove. They lived in an old ramshackle cabin and they just kind of became celebrities to, uh, to the people around the Springfield Christian County area. And uh, as a result, they even got a piece, a piece uh, recorded for them on a local TV station. And I'm gonna try to play this for you. It lasts about six or seven minutes, but remember this was only about 40 years ago. And I can guarantee you there are people like Roscoe and Clarence still around. Uh, so here are two guys that aren't a mindset, they actually live the lifestyle of the hillbilly. They live deep in the woods of Christian County, and you may have seen them on the back roads around Nixa and Clever, Missouri. Clarence and Roscoe Jones, father and son, they depend on horses. How old is this harness that you have here? <laughs> That's a question, Steve Curry. Clarence and Roscoe get by only on what they need, and their needs are basic and have not changed with the decades. How many horses have you had in your life? Oh, God, don't ask me that. Never stop to count them up? No. They have electricity, but little use for it or anything else of today's world. Their horses and mules are the mainstay and focus of their days. Well, uh, these tractors, now I'm going to tell you about them. These tractors, I didn't have to know. My horse is all I know anything about. You. Have you ever driven a tractor? Huh? Have you ever driven a tractor? No, I never did get in a tractor. Ever driven a truck? I ain't got no use for it. Why don't you have use for trucks? Huh? Why not? Well, where could I use it? A lot of people would want to use trucks on a farm. Yeah. Back then. Where could I use a tractor around here? Oh, no. When you can't walk down here on this bluff without falling down, yeah. you can't walk on the other without falling down. It's not. If you think you've seen Clarence and Roscoe Jones before, it's because they've enjoyed a unique distinction. A dozen years ago, they were featured on a record album cover, The Ozark Mountain Daredevils, an album called Men From Earth. But more than the album cover, they are known in Christian County, Missouri, just for who they are and the way they live. A father and son getting by and working their teams in the fields and back roads of the Ozarks. From Christian County, Missouri, this is Ed Filmer reporting. What, I'm unmuting us. So, yeah, there are still hillbillies. Now, you can find them. They're 
not very many of them anymore. By the way, I have to tell you, uh, that story doesn't end happily, okay? Uh, if you notice here, this is a, uh, a benefit poster that was put out for Clarence and Roscoe. A few years after this happened, after they became famous on the cover of the uh, Ozark Mountain Daredevils album, a couple of miscreants from Ozark uh, went to their cabin thinking they must have had surely a lot of money for being on the cover and beat them to a fin an inch of their life. In fact, the dad did die within a couple of days and uh, Clarence, in our, pardon me, Roscoe ended up being in a nursing home for about three years before he succumbed to his injuries and eventually died. Uh, so it did not have a happy ending. Um, that's another unfortunate trait that you'll find a lot in the Ozarks and sometimes in the rest of the world. But I thought I needed to show you that because I wanted you to see what a genuine hillbilly really does look like. So what are we going to talk about next week? Well, we're going to talk about rivers and streams and springs. If you aren't familiar with the Ozarks, I'm telling you, there are so many rivers and so many springs in the Ozarks. Uh, they're just all over the place. Some of them are so huge. One of them uh, called Big Springs down around Van Buren, Missouri, puts out enough water every day to satisfy the water needs of New York City. That's how big it is. It's a gigantic spring. And uh, I'll show you a picture of that spring next week. We're going to talk about the rivers and the streams and the springs because the land and the water really are what made the Ozarks. Uh, that's why people came here to begin with. Uh, the land isn't great and the water, the rivers aren't real big for the most part, but they're what made this area what it is. So, uh, I hope you've enjoyed today. I hope you've learned something. Uh, I hope you'll stay with me. It's going to get interesting. We're going to talk about a lot of really neat things. And, uh, you know, you're going to learn about a region if you don't live here that uh, maybe you've heard about, but don't really know that much about. So with that, I'm going to sign off. I'm a little early, about five minutes left. So uh, anybody have any questions, by the way? And um, just a reminder to everybody, if you want to catch that last um, session of the church history tomorrow, we will do that at 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern. It'll also be up on our Arrow YouTube channel. So thank you so much, Tony. Okay. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Really. Yeah. I, I, so. I hope some of you enjoyed it. I hope you had a good time. I can, Art and I can kind of, uh, of feel the same way because we, I'm from, I'm Okie from Muskogee, but my dad was uh, pretty much like a hillbilly uh -huh. in a way and, and Art's family too, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I can relate to some of this then. Absolutely. Okay, well, we will talk to you next week and uh, interested in tuning in to my last presentation on uh, ancient history in the Bible. Make sure at two o'clock Central Standard Time, or you can see it on recording because I have Rachel's going to record it for us. Yep. Good. Perfect. All right, everybody, have a great rest of your afternoon. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye.